Thank you all for joining the conference. Uh, my name is Turan Bali. Uh, I am the Robert Parker Chair Professor of Finance at Georgetown. Uh, my area of expertise, uh, broadly speaking, lies in asset pricing and risk management. Uh, more specifically, I've been interested in developing uh, quant investment strategies with individual stocks, corporate bonds, and derivatives. Now, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker, Barbara Novik. Uh, Barbara is the vice chairman and co-founder of BlackRock, uh, the largest asset manager in the world with $7 trillion in assets under management. Uh, she's also a member of BlackRock's global executive committee and the enterprise risk and geopolitical risk committee. From the inception of the firm uh, in 1988 to 2008, she headed the global client group and oversaw global business development, marketing and client service across equity, fixed income, alternative investments and real estate products for both institutional and individual investors. In 2009, Barbara formed BlackRock's Global Public Policy Group, and she currently oversees the firm's efforts globally for public policy. She published a number of articles on asset management and public policy issues. Uh, she earned a BA in economics degree from Cornell, and she currently serves as vice chairman of Cornell University's Board of Trustees. She is also a member of MSCI's Editorial Advisory Board, a Committee on Capital Markets Regulation, Center for Financial Stability Advisory Board, and the list goes on. She has an incredible resume, uh, which I cannot summarize in such a short period of time. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Barbara and turn it over to John. Thank you very much, Turner. I appreciate it. Welcome, Barbara. Very much looking forward to this conversation. Um, so BlackRock has such an important role in, in, this, in the US and global economy. You touched literally millions of investors of every shape and size. So I think your insights are gonna be really helpful for us. So the first question I have is, let's, let's jump right into something at the top of the list, COVID and the pandemic. So can you, from your insights, can you give us, a, and from your position, can you give us some insights into this, the impact on our economy, on individuals, and how do you see that impact playing out over time? Uh, first of all, thank you for including me today. I'm excited to be here. So, you know, COVID is interesting in that um, I would say from an economic perspective, if you can look past the short-term issues, it's essentially an accelerator of trends that were already in place. So what do I mean by that? Technology is a disruptor. It's a disruptor in books, in music, in transportation, in hospitality, in education, in, in so many parts of our economy. And we expect when you look at the end of COVID as we come out of this crisis, that there are going to be winners and losers, and it's going to be clearly tied to the technology aspect. So what's going to happen to retail brick and mortar stores or hotels or restaurants? Um, some of them have been able to transform themselves. In the case of uh, retail, the e-commerce, everybody's getting something delivered. Um, in healthcare, telemedicine, which was pretty nascent, has become actually quite common. So those are just two examples. It also means something in terms of the skill set that will be required to succeed in the new economy. And lastly, I would say work will never be the same. Um, it, employees are realizing that they value the increased flexibility. That doesn't mean they necessarily wanna be burrowed in their home for their entire career, but the idea of a five-day commuting work schedule um, is being challenged. And that, of course, then has um, questions for where do people want to live? Uh, what is the shape of the office of the future? Um, and even, you know, how much of this migration to cities versus suburbs or even rural areas? So I think there's going to be a lot to think about and a lot of change that comes out of this. But again, most of it being tied to technology and really accelerating what was already in place. Um, I'll also mention, I saw the prior slot with uh, Henry and you know, the whole idea of ESG and sustainability. Again, another trend that's just being accelerated. We could talk about that more later. Great, thank you. So it's clear the business is being impacted by COVID, accelerating the trends, technology, huge impact. The other thing that's, that's really affecting, um, impacting, uh, impacting uh, BlackRock over years is, and all asset managers is, 
looking at what you do in 2020 versus 2010 and to, to 2000, et cetera, there are huge trends reshaping asset management, right? Across the board, they are index investing, sustainability, regulation, technology. So can you touch upon, you know, from the other, the, the, not just the external forces, but what is changing, you know, fundamentally within asset management? Right, so those are four key trends. And let me start with indexing and give a little bit of historical perspective. Um, BlackRock purchased BGI in 2010. And obviously that brought us into the index business. But even before then, we were having conversations with our clients about alpha versus beta and the beta exposure, getting that as cheaply as possible. So index being a core holding for many, many of our clients well before we were in that space. And then building a portfolio that would have satellites of active strategies around that core. Our insight in buying BGI was you could have the one provider provide both the core and the satellites. So starting with indexing, the growth of indexing, it started slow and it's been accelerating a lot. Um, reasons for that include value proposition, uh, you know, low cost solution for the beta and whether it's at the individual level or the institutional level, why pay extra for you know, just the exposure to the sector. Um, second is a regulatory one. And you're to see all these trends are really closely interrelated, right? So the more regulators focus on fees and disclosure of fees and encourage low cost products, you kind of come back to index investing as a, a viable um, option. And then changes in the brokerage model itself. If you think back um, years ago, there was a stockbroker. Then the stockbroker kind of morphed into a mutual fund picker. And now today, those same individuals are financial planners. And they're almost many investment managers. They want to work with you on an asset allocation. They want low cost building blocks. And then they're going to put an asset allocation fee over it. So the, the change in their model leads you from higher cost active products to lower cost index products that are then those building blocks. So we move on the second trend, sustainable investing. Again, historical perspective is helpful. I remember when this began, it was socially responsible investing. So you asked Henry, um, people want to give up or are they willing to give up return for doing good? Uh, the doing good versus doing well. And what we would say is there are some strategies that are designed specifically to reflect client values. You know, I'm a healthcare company and I don't want in my pension, I don't want exposure to tobacco or I'm a religious order and I don't want exposure to defense stocks or whatever they I don't want is related to the values of the organization. That's considered ESG in some ways um, but it's very much values driven. Today, we would not talk so much about socially responsible investing as we would talk about sustainable investing. And the difference being that governance, uh, environmental and social factors being thought of more as investment factors of value. If you manage them well, we would expect a better return over time. So instead of giving something up by focusing on value drivers, these can be positive or negative. And, and I think Henry gave a number of examples of you know, companies where they didn't do things so well and that's a destroyer of value. So looking at these three factors as important to the long-term value of the company is a very different way of thinking about it. And it leads you to different kinds of products. So for example, we today have screened products, like in that first category. We have products we call advanced products, really optimize certain ESG characteristics. Um, and then we have impact products that might focus on a specific green bonds or wind and solar power. So there's a lot of different ways of constructing ESG. The third area you, you asked about was regulations. My group only began in 2009 at BlackRock. And Prior to that, we, we were certainly aware of regulation. There was a lot of regulation, but there was nothing that we felt we really needed to have a seat at the table and really be involved in the decision-making. 
coming out of the great financial crisis, we had a very different insight that investors were going to be an important component of this. And we wanted any new rules to be at least as good, if not better, for investors broadly. Those are our end clients. So when you look today at the wave of things that happened over the last 10 years, um, it's everything from retirement policies to proxy voting to um, an ETF rule to a derivatives rule to a whole host of ESG rules around the world. And so regulation is just now embedded in, in everything, literally. And that leads us to the last of the four, which is technology. And technology is both a driver of some of the other things, but it's also a reflection that you need scale today. You need technology, otherwise you just can't cope with all the information. So I use a simple example, indices, right? So MSCI has gazillion indices. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can count them all, all these different variations. As a manager, our client might pick this, you know, version A, B, or C. We need to know what the components of that index are every day, be able to measure our portfolio against the proper index every day. Rating agency data changes all the time. Pricing data. So there's just so much information that needs to be there. Customer interfaces. Clients want you to meet them where they are. They don't want you to tell them, I have old technology. You, you figure out how to come to me. You're not going to have your clients very long, right? It's like Blockbuster versus Netflix. Um, so you know whether it's in the client experience, it's in operational efficiency, or it's in investment insights, technology today, again, just like regulation, it permeates everything we do. And that's true in many industries, not just in asset management. Right. Thank you. So let's expand a little bit on the sustainability conversation. So the interest in ESG is exploding. It is, and, and it's, so can you comment a little bit on where it's coming from, from your perspective? Investors, shareholders, employees, customers, policymakers, media. Uh, I'm sure it's coming from all of them, but maybe kind of put it in proportion or perspective for us. <clears throat> oh, I was going to start by saying yes, because <laughs> <laughs> it is coming from all of them. But I'm going to define two terms. Asset owners, those are our end clients, the pension funds, insurance companies, uh, sovereign wealth funds, I mean, uh, foundations and analysis, many, many different types, but the asset owners, even at the individual level, at the end of the day, they control asset allocation decisions. They're going to decide to buy a product from BlackRock or a product from a competitor. They're going to decide to buy equities or fixed income. They're going to decide to buy an ESG product or a non-ESG product. That's an important insight. As an asset manager, asset managers, I think, have an obligation to offer a range of products for different clients with different preferences or different investment needs. And what we've done is we have active, we have index, we have all sorts of different flavors. And what we see is the asset owners are voting with their feet. Now, of course, their feet in this case is more their wallet, mm -hmm. um, but they are allocating money, especially in the last couple of years, in dramatic proportion towards ESG products. It's true in ETFs, it's true in green bonds, it's true in private funds that focus on wind and solar power. It's even true in cash. We launched a series called LEAF, which stands for liquid environmental something or other. And... Um, it's basically a cash product. It's a money market fund product. Went from zero to over $3 billion in record time. And it's a US and European offerings in the series. So you realize even in cash, people are thinking about ESG characteristics. And then our own um, BlackRock uh, Investment Institute, they've done a number of research reports showing the importance of ESG in certain kinds of um, products. So commercial real estate is an obvious one. You have increased flooding. So what does that mean for different properties or utilities? Some are coal-based, some are oil, some are gas, you know, some are, are hydro. Understanding the mix that a utility has, how much have they moved towards alternatives? Um, and municipalities, right? Municipalities have very different issues um, depending on where they're located and what is environmental issues might be in their midst. So we look at all of these things. Those are three 
sector examples where you can measure the impact on returns. And over time, obviously, as the data gets better, I think you'll be able to look at this over many more sectors and prove out not just the um, E, but you know, governance. We can already see this as a number of academic studies. And next, I think, will be social to see you know, what is the impact of companies with better scores versus um, weaker scores. Right. Um, I want to bring up a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I've spent over 30 years at NASDAQ, capital markets, worked on thousands of IPOs, worked with public companies. And to me, the greatest threat facing public markets, NASDAQ, New York, and all the public markets is short-termism versus long-termism and the changing role of stakeholder capitalism. And uh, so I'd love to get your insights on that because I truly believe that the short-term focus, the earnings calls every 90 days, the daily report cards on stock price is affecting how management makes decisions um, at the expense of long-term or sustainable um, uh, operations. So if, um, I, I'm a little biased with the question, but if you could just weigh in and give me your thoughts as well. So, um, you know, we get a lot of questions about uh, stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism, sometimes framed as uh, Milton Friedman versus Larry Fink or vice versa. <laughs> and I, I actually look at it differently, and I'm going to use stakeholder capitalism and try and build out a couple of examples that put it in a very different perspective. So the first one is if you look at your four key stakeholders away from shareholders, you've got employees, customers, communities, and suppliers. So on the employees, imagine a company, two companies in the identical business where one offers training, um, health, better health benefits, better vacation, um, you know, education, a whole host of better benefits. And they're in a competitive market for talent. Which one's going to attract better talent? It seems pretty obvious, the one that's got better benefits. And who's going to keep their employees longer? And lower turnover probably has some productivity implications. So I look at employees and I say, really, the, the key issue here is, do you wanna attract and retain better quality employees? It would seem that you wanna think of them as a stakeholder. Um, customers. I happen to have grown up in a retail business where my father taught me the customer's always right. I always come back to that as like kind of my true north. I ran our client business for 20 years. If a customer had a complaint I wanted to hear and understand what that complaint was. Maybe we didn't always agree, but we had to at least see it from their perspective. And usually we learned something. And I gotta say, if you don't think of your customers that way, you won't have customers. <laughs> so when people say they don't agree with stakeholder capitalism and, and why, you know, why are you factoring employees and customers? I say, why wouldn't you be in, factoring in employees and customers? Now, you can go to communities and say, well, that's a little fluffier. Okay, well, do you really think if you're in a uh, natural resources business and you create some natural disaster, uh, well, it's not a natural disaster if you created it, but you create a disastrous condition in that community, you know, a flood, uh, 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 whatever, a fire, could be anything. What, what's, what's the licensing for you to reopen? What's the chance the next door community wants you in their presence? So looking at your communities, both from the downside of making sure you're, you're operating properly, but then there's the upside. And COVID has really pointed that out. You know, we have a global pandemic that has hurt individuals horribly. There are lines for food banks everywhere you look. As an employer, if you are doing well, and a lot of companies aren't doing well. I mean, it's really been interesting to see. Some companies are outright thriving. If you're in that situation, I think you should be thinking very seriously about how can you help the communities where you work and offer products and are you know, somehow doing business because they need help. And I think it's very short-sighted to say, oh, well, that's not my problem. It is all of our problem. And whether it's the downside of don't do bad things or it's the upside of do good things, I think at the end of the day, these all accrue to your reputation 
and inf- impact your company over a long period of time. And I'll use the fourth one, suppliers. Um, I gotta say, I wouldn't have thought of this on my own as much, but again, COVID brought out some examples as we did engagements with companies. And a company that was doing pretty well said, you know, we made a decision to give a long-term contract to some of our suppliers, really. Well, it wasn't out of the goodness of our heart. It was us realizing that the uncertainty created by COVID meant they might lay off their employees, which would affect our supply chain. So even from a self-interest, they wanted to do the right thing for suppliers because they realized it was going to accrue to their benefit at the end of the day. So I think it's, it's that thinking ahead, thinking the, the second order effects. And if people think about it that way, I think there'll be less of this conflict because the four example I, I just gave, if you go down the path I suggest, you actually have a win-win. And so it's not either or, I think it can be collectively both. Thank you. And I agree with you 100%. It was, I don't look at it as, um, you know, Larry Fink, uh, you know, it, it, either one. I look at it that it's when you realize a shareholder value. And if you're focused on the day, today, then you're a trader, not an investor. If you should focus. So there's a difference between investing and trading and which, you know, and, and how you want to do it and build a business for a sustainable business. So thank you for that. Um, so couple of things and to that point about companies being proactive etc you've written a series of papers on lessons of COVID-19 so why did you write these papers and what were your key lessons from these papers so switching a bit away from the sustainability issues um, there's also a whole new set of financial stability issues that come out of this crisis so unlike the great financial crisis, which started in the banking and, and financial system with leverage and bad underwriting and all sorts of problems, and then propagated out and obviously caused tremendous damage to companies and individuals, this crisis goes the other way. It starts as a health crisis, a global pandemic. Then you have governments shutting down huge swaths of the economy. And then you have uncertainty about what's the value of those companies. Um, you even have questions about municipalities and you know, revenues versus expenses. And the next thing you know, the market sees up. So now you have a financial issue. As we look at that, and we were obviously quite present in March, as we look at that, we realize um, that there's going to be lessons from that. And it's going to be important to look at the data and say, what did we learn, good and bad? What should we be doing to make the system more resilient? Now, it happens that today, just this morning, the Financial Stability Board issued their report on COVID-19. So we knew when the G20 was, which is this coming weekend, and we've been working very hard um, to write our own papers, which capture that data and Mm -hmm. talk about specific market segments, so short-term markets, open-end funds, ETFs, CCPs, the central uh, clearing platforms. And, excuse me, and not surprisingly, those are similar topics, if not identical topics, to what's covered in the um, FSB report. And in each of our reports, we try to both bring data and facts and then make the recommendations because we realize as investors, We wanna make sure that the market plumbing works. We want markets that are more resilient. We have the same interest as they have. So I don't see it as an, again, it's not a conflict, it's not either or, it's a, can we work together on this using our insights, using collective insights and come up with policy measures that at the end of the day are gonna be better for investors going forward. Um, so in March, when all this hit and uh, the world changed, some bond mutual funds and bond ETFs experienced some very large price dislocations between their market prices and their net asset values. People with longstanding concerns about putting relatively illiquid assets into products that are allowed for daily redemptions, ETFs, funds, or intraday trading say this was evidence that their concerns are warranted. Do you agree with them? Well, um... Actually, I'm going to say a little bit different, okay? Okay. And first, I would start with open-end funds and ETFs are significantly different from each other. 
So I'll start with ETFs because I think it's the easier one. I call ETFs the heroes, not the villains in March. And what do I mean by that? Volume on the exchange soared. But that's different than volume in the underlying bonds. The secondary market trading was huge, and that's important. That means the bonds themselves didn't have to trade at all, but I'm going to sell you my shares. You're going to sell your shares to someone else. Sp the volume spikes. We've seen that same thing every time there's been a crisis. And that means people are getting price discovery. They're getting liquidity. They're getting very efficient transactions in terms of cost. And they're doing it even if the underlying market in this case isn't trading. So a pretty clear um, set of wins. People talk about the discounts. Actually, when the bonds underneath started trading, they moved closer to the ETFs. So even the FSB report today um, says some pretty positive things. And I think there's a, a greater understanding today of ETFs than there were years ago. Open-end funds, very different set of issues. First thing is every open-end fund met 100% of their redemptions in the U.S., the exceptions for open-end funds are outside of the U.S. There's some U.K. property funds, which have closed before. Um, those are a unique case. There's some Indian bond funds that had a lot of private placements. Again, a somewhat unique case. And there's some Northern European bond funds where there were some underlying market issues. They, they closed with the um, consent of the regulators. In fact, I think it was uh, very much jointly done. So those are the exceptions. All other bond funds met 100% of their redemptions. Why is that? The SEC said it very nicely in their report, liquidity risk management. So liquidity risk management is not just how much cash do you have. Liquidity and cash, cash is a component of liquidity, but it's not equal to liquidity. And so when you look at things like the SEC or the ESMA rules for liquidity risk management, you have layers of liquidity. You have a whole regime about um, you know, predicting redemptions, preparing for it, having um, you know, tools that can be used in a crisis, tools that we used every day. And they're not always the same in every jurisdiction. So our conclusion was liquidity risk management really did work. While people talk about redemptions from open-end funds, the percentage was actually quite modest. It was you know, in the low single digits. So the dollar amount might have been big industry-wide, but any individual fund had plenty of liquidity to meet their demand. The one thing that we would recommend is we saw a difference in Europe versus US. There's a tool called swing pricing. And swing pricing, the shorthand is you put a bid-ask spread at the fund level. So if you are coming into the fund or you're redeeming shares from a fund and it's a large amount and it's gonna impact the market, you are going to pay the transaction costs of your actions. It's very reasonable, good for the other investors, very fair. It also means you might say, you know, I know I wanna make this large redemption, but I'm gonna spread it out over three days or five days. Maybe I don't wanna have such a big transaction that I'm gonna be moving the market that I have to pay for that. So it actually changes behavior in addition to being fair. We have that tool available in Europe. We use it every day, different funds, different needs. During the crisis, obviously we used it more. In the US, it's technically legal, but there's no way to operationalize it. And there's a whole, that could be a whole lecture of its own. So the one thing that we are, have gone on record as saying we'd love to see is the ability to operationalize swing pricing in the US. We see how well it worked in Europe. And in the US, we managed. It worked out okay. But boy, that would be a nice tool to have. Great. Well, that's very insightful. And, and speaking of tools, in March and April, the Fed you know, opened up the old playbook from the financial crisis and looked out a bunch of different facilities to support you know, the strained credit markets, everything from commercial paper, asset-backed securities, bonds, muni bonds, corporate bonds, et cetera. What changes or what tools should the Fed have or should we put in the marketplace to reduce the need for you know, massive Fed intervention in the future, besides the swing price you just mentioned? Right. So I mentioned before, it, it's a lot more complicated than you know, just a bank or just a mutual fund or just any one component. 
And the point of our papers, and I would recommend anybody who wants to read more, they're all on our website. There's one that's an overview. And the overview points out the breadth of the ecosystem, right? So you've got pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, all these other kinds of asset owners, just like you have them for ESG reasons, you have them for financial stability reasons. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand what their asset allocation is and what causes them to shift. So for example, pension funds, have an investment policy statement with a target range. When you see this big an asset um, change in price in equities versus bonds, that kind of dislocation leads to an almost automatic rebalance. So a huge amount of money came out of bonds and into equities from pension plans. That's fine, that's, that's what they do. If we only look at mutual funds, we miss that point because Mutual funds are maybe 20% of any asset class. So what we've done is we've gone through, and as I mentioned, sector by sector and looking at different products and different issues. And our conclusion is we recommend what we call a three pillar approach. First pillar is the banks themselves. Mm -hmm. They come into the crisis, great capital, great liquidity, all very strong, very positive. But then they step back from market making and don't do any market making, none. So what do you do with that? Well, if that's the new reality, then you need to do something else for market structure. Even if you fix banks, our second pillar is market structure. And fixing banks is, is not a wholesale reform. It's they've built up these buffers in peacetime. You want them to be able to use them in wartime. And what we saw in this crisis is the banks were very reluctant to use their buffers because they were afraid of you know, actions down the road. What if a lot of loans go bad? What if the rating agencies you know, penalize them for using the buffer? Like there were all sorts of reasons, but that needs to be looked at, examined, understood, and, and addressed. Then second is that market structure. And I actually think the market structure is the most important of the three pillars. Our market structure today, especially in commercial paper, in treasuries, in fixed income, is not fit for purpose. Every one of these sectors has grown a lot. And if the banks aren't going to intermediate, we don't have a market structure in place that makes sense. Electronic mm -hmm. trading has grown, that's good. There's several good providers. Um, it's growing, I think, exponentially. Um, treasuries is more principal trading firms than it is dealer, you know, broker dealers or you know, the, the traditional um, bank um, model, but it's not enough. And it may be central clearing. You know, we've had a number of proposals come out on all to all platforms. Commercial paper, right now, the market structure is a series of monopolies where if you buy commercial paper, you can only sell it back to the bank you bought it from. Well, if the bank closes, <laughs> closes for business, you can sell it to no one. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So again, some kind of either central clearing, all to all, we wanna be careful. You don't wanna to concentrate too much risk in one place, but we do need a different solution than what we have today. And then as I promised, there's a third pillar. And the third pillar is we're not saying don't look here because we're very realistic. Money market funds, open-end funds, even ETFs, like there are definitely things that could be done better Money market funds, the 30% test being, you know, a, your liquidity is tied to a decision about gates and fees. Well, quite honestly, that meant you couldn't use your liquidity. So you've built up a buffer of 30%. Do you realize no money fund could even touch the 30%? So what's the buffer for? You've just created a new floor. That, that's, that's pro-cyclical. It doesn't make any, any sense from a stability standpoint. Um, CCPs, you know, they increased margin a lot. So I think looking at the interconnectivity of all these pieces and then being eyes wide open that you need to understand the ecosystem itself and then look at all three of these pillars and find ways you can improve all of them. Sometimes what we find is a little tweak here and there and there and there. 10 of those little tweaks is more important than one big bang. And that's true of the equity markets. So when you think of the equity markets in this crisis, precipitous decline, system-wide um, you know, closes, 
limit up, limit up, limit down. Tremendous volatility. Have you heard one commentator say the equity markets were broken? Right. And yet, you know, in the last 10 years, we had flash crashes, we had problems in equities. And you know what? There's a dozen small things that were changed that improved the resiliency of the equity markets. And so in this crisis, tremendous volatility, but not broken. And that's, that's the kind of learnings when I talk about learn, you know, looking at the lessons and looking at what worked, not just what didn't work. We need to learn what worked and see what ideas we can port to the areas that didn't work. And there's quite a few of those. And, and I think I'm, I'm actually very optimistic. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, after 30 years in the markets, it was the, the micro inefficiencies that you fixed that seemed to have bigger impact than, you know, the big bangs every once in a while. So I do believe in that's a series of just, that's just dedicated hard work, just keep notes to the grindstone kind of stuff, eke it out and, and that the industry has to fight about, but they get it done in the end. I think that's the important thing. So I think that that's a great lesson learned. I want to close and ask you to speak to uh, an audience, uh, part of our audience here, um, and the whole audience, obviously, but focus on part of our audience. So look, you work in a very large global company in a tremendously competitive field. You are highly successful. You're just an amazing role model. So now I want you to share some direction, specific direction, advice you'd give to the women, other minorities, our students in the audience. Speak to them about in this environment, based on your career and your highly successful career, Give them some advice for the next couple of minutes. Okay. So first thing I'm going to say is um, my advice is not gender specific or um, any other class of people. It's sure. just young people specific. So okay. if you're starting your career, and this is these are things that are true over the course of your career. Um, first thing would be just be open and try new things. You know, I'm still learning. I mean, I'm 60 years old and I consider myself a student of the markets and I'm always learning something new. And that's a very, very important lesson to carry out throughout your career. And it means accepting and also seeking sometimes new challenges. Um, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it's even good to be uncomfortable, but it doesn't come naturally. You have to right. consciously do that. Um, second is turn change into opportunity. You, the people who pine for the past are just become, um, I'd say, very stuck and very unhappy. Uh, I think it's all about looking forward, seeing where you can, um, you know, whether it's a new boss, it's new regulation, it's a new assignment. How can you take that change and, and turn it into something that's good, um, not just for you, but for clients, for, for the, the overall system? Um, you know, maybe a little bit more gender specific would be take a seat at the table. I see mm -hmm. so many times people come into a room and, you know, the men, even young men, they sit at the table and the women will go to what I call the bleachers. Um, that behavior is a learned behavior and it can be unlearned. And, and I really encourage people, if you come in the room, and you're the first one and just sit at the table. That's what the guy's going to do. You should do it too. Um, and nice. you should speak up. If you have a seat at the table, yeah. you, you should not be bashful if you have good ideas, offer those um, and try wherever possible to propose solutions, not just to point out problems. Um, I think if you follow those things, uh, generally you have a good outcome. Great, thank you very much. Um, Barbara, I really want to tell you how much I appreciate and everyone in Georgetown in the audience appreciates your very thoughtful insights and, and your willingness to share that with us. And I know you've got a few things going on right now. So we do appreciate your time and uh, hope you will come back and join us again. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me.